John, over the past 10 days, we've had a, a, an extraordinarily uh, volatile and uh, uh, unpredictable 10 days to go through. Uh, how do you think they fit into the Brexit saga, which has dominated British politics for the past six or eight years? Well, as you argued when we last um, discussed all this, uh, that the budget that Kwasi Kwarteng did and the whole platform upon which Liz Truss actually gained the leadership of the Conservative Party was to implement um, a particular version of Brexit, which was essentially Singapore on Thames. And I think what has happened, I mean, far swifter than anyone might have imagined, is that this has been exploded. And it's been exploded by, um, ironically, the market forces that um, the advocates of uh, this um, red in tooth and claw uh, capitalist vision um, most admire. Um, so it, it's, um, it, it is, I think, the, the death knell of one version of Brexit. But of course, there was another version of Brexit <laughs> and um, which was almost diametrically opposed to, to the Singapore on Thames agenda, what one might describe as a sort of fortress England agenda, anti-immigration, um, very uh, relaxed about trade, um, not really wanting to have a, um, a, a, an internationalized economy, in fact, reversing many of the elements of globalization. Um, and uh, also, spending a great deal of money uh, on levelling up, on appealing to the red wall seats that um, got Johnson elected in, in 2019. And it's the, been the confusion between these two visions of Brexit, both of which were promoted in the 2016 referendum, despite the fact that they were completely mutually incompatible, um, that has caused the current crisis. It was a, a deliberate decision taken by the people running the Leave campaign in 2016 that they wouldn't specify what kind of future United Kingdom they wanted after Brexit so that everybody could paint their own image of Brexit in their own mind. And as you say, the, the particular contradictions um, wouldn't, wouldn't be exposed. Um, do you think that what's happened over the past 10 days means the end of Brexit, that the end of Brexit is likely to come quicker? Um, or is it um, simply going to carry on as before? Well, I certainly think that it is a severe blow to Brexit. The problem is that the way in which Brexit has happened uh, and the fact of Brexit itself um, is very difficult to reverse. Um, the loss of trust that there has been with the EU is enormous. And that is before we consider any terms that would be necessary for us to accept now in order to rejoin. So uh, the, the problem is that the Brexiteers have created not just an enormous problem, but they've created an enormous problem which is exceedingly difficult to correct. And I fear that the crisis which we have seen in the markets and the, the loss of confidence in the UK as an entity overall um, is only beginning probably because um, the essence of Brexit is that it, the problems it creates are cumulative, whether we're talking about trade, whether we're talking about financial services in the city of London and its role in the economy, whether we're talking about the rise of nationalism in Northern Ireland or Scotland. I mean, these are all processes that are ongoing and are likely to get much more serious. You, you've talked about the difficulties of rejoining, the scepticism with which many of our partners, our former partners in the EU regard us. Um, do you see a, any possibility of a, a realignment of British politics, which might make it easier um, for the EU to accept that there was a, a consistent and coherent majority in favour of remaining in the EU, because obviously their fear is that uh, a conservative government will come back in five or 10 years time um, and undo any rejoining that might have taken place in the interim. I think that's very difficult to imagine under the current party system. 
The real problem, though, is a psychological one. I think that Brexit has revealed so many underlying problems in the UK. Deep, deep divisions that, and deep deficiencies, which go back a long time. And Brexit was a revolt against quite a lot of what had been dominant in Britain over the last 30 or 40 years. It had features in it of class war, of regional differences, of generation war, uh, even conceivably racial tensions. And it has created major problems for the sort of economy that came into being following deindustrialization. De we put everything into services and the king pin of that was financial services. And that is seriously threatened by Brexit. So what we have is an extremely complex and deep seated problem. And the fear of this problem has led to a paralysis in British politics. It's why the Labour Party can't face up to saying that Brexit has to be reversed. The Liberal Democrats are in the same position. And of course, the Conservative Party is now completely tied to the fate of Brexit. If Brexit fails, that is the end, not just of this government, but it is the end of conservatism as we have known it. Because these debates between Singapore on Thames and Fortress England, I mean, those shorthands for, for the forces that have determined Brexit, that neither of those ideas are remotely conservative. They're not even really very British. And but despite what um, you're saying, the opinion polls suggest that uh, a majority of the, uh, of the voters certainly regard Brexit as a mistake uh, and might well be prepared to envisage rejoining. Um, given that, isn't there an opportunity for the Labour Party or a lab, Lib Lab coalition um, to take a more courageous, a more anti-Brexit stance? Uh, does it have to be as, um, uh, as intractable as you suggest? Well, they have to overcome this fear that any form of reversing Brexit is going to be an extremely risky proposition uh, and one that is going to throw up all sorts of opposition and, and, and difficulties. But of course, not reversing Brexit will also do that. And that's the, the scale of the problem that we have. And that's led to the immobility. I think that the more people realize that Brexit has been a disaster, the easier is it, it should be to make the case for rejoining. But that case does have to be far more honest than a large part of the Remain campaign was. Um, back in 2016, it has to accept that the, the nature of being in the European Union is far more binding than um, we had been able to enjoy in the opt-outs and the semi-detachment that we'd had um, before 2016. And in particular, it needs facing up to issues like ever closer union, like uh, the agenda that is now being pursued on the continent for um, more integration, particularly economic integration, particularly uh, joining the euro. And these are enormous arguments to, to be made in England. I think that the situation obviously in Scotland and Northern Ireland is different. It was a, a great paradox, wasn't it, of the Remain campaign? that they tried to praise our, our membership of the European Union on the basis that we had lots of opt-outs. Um, obviously, people accepted that argument and decided they carry it to its logical conclusion. They'd opt out of the European Union. What, what do you think is going to happen um, over the next couple of years? Do you think there's going to be an election soon? Or will it be in a couple of years' time? Uh, and if so, what will the result of it be? I can't see... Uh any Conservatives wanting a general election anytime soon. Uh, I think the question of whether um, Liz Truss remains Prime Minister is, is a somewhat different one. And of course, changing Prime Minister yet again, particularly in these circumstances, um, is an extremely complicated matter and could be conducted so incompetently um, 
and so fissiparously for the Conservatives that a general election might indeed occur. But I don't think that is the most likely outcome. I think one has to accept that this government is going to be around probably for its full term, which could mean January 2025 for the next election. Um, but the problems which are now uh, deep-seated uh, in the UK economy particularly are not going to go away. In fact, they're going to get worse in my view. And so we are in for a rough ride. But may the Labour Party not be forced by the events of the next couple of years and the very great likelihood of its forming the next government um, to adopt ra rather more detailed, rather more coherent policies uh, on the range of issues that you're talking about than they have up till now. Uh, up to now, obviously, and understandably, the Labour Party has just been content um, to watch the Conservative Party tearing itself apart. Um, but will it really be able to continue holding that line for the next couple of years if the situation uh, deteriorates in the way that you fear? I'm not sure that uh, they will feel the need to move very far beyond where they are now. I mean, Keir Starmer has created the situation in which, uh, by saying nothing, he will benefit simply from the disarray of the government. And the more disarray of the government there is, um, the easier that option will become and the more plausible it will become. Uh, I think the only circumstance in which this could change is if there was any prospect of the Labour Party not winning massively at the next general election, if there was some uh, clawback in the polls in some way, or, and this perhaps is a more interesting option, if there was some form of split in the Conservative Party, which would precipitate an early election, or could precipitate an early election, and that might also engender uh, a rethinking of the of the Labour Party's approach. But I fear that at the moment, um, they are simply benefiting from the fact that they are not the Conservative Party. And that is a strategy that um, they see no reason fundamentally to change. Do you think that the events of the past 10 days have brought Scottish independence and the United Ireland closer? I think... Probably, yes, um, because obviously the more chaos there is in London and in the London government, um, the more um, the proposition of, of Scottish independence looks credible. I think if Labour were to move on any subject ahead of the general election, it will not be so much on Europe, but it could be on Scotland, because... Scotland really is an absolutely central issue. The Labour Party does not wish to preside over losing Scotland. And I think that a campaign to restore Labour's status in Scotland as the main unionist party, which previously, of course, has been a position enjoyed by the Conservatives, could be um, a consequence of what is currently going on. Um, Ireland is a somewhat different matter because uh, it's quite obvious now that the pressure on the government to uh, accommodate uh, the European Union with regards to the protocol is greater than ever. Um, it remains to be seen whether this will be accepted by uh, the more extreme end of unionism. Uh, and there are some slightly alarming developments that suggest that this might not be a smooth path at all. But in principle, a deal on the protocol will lessen the credibility of Sinn Féin's push for a, a border poll. Um, but these are very, very uncertain developments. And certainly, the, the, the issue of the unity of the United Kingdom, I think, is going to become more and more central to political debate uh, between now and the next general election and will probably be a greater factor than discussions about uh, getting closer to the European Union, some form of reversal of Brexit. I might just end that by advocating a closer relationship with the EU, such as, for example, joining, rejoining the single market, actually would make Scottish independence a lot easier, just as agreeing on the protocol 
in Northern Ireland also has some impact on the debate in Scotland, because the, some Scottish nationalists would say, well, if Northern Ireland can have a special deal with the EU, why can't we? Do you think the idea, the prospect of simply rejoining the, Europe, the um, single market uh, is one which is feasible? It's uh, often talked about in this uh, easy way, uh, as if the United Kingdom just had to suggest it, and the EU would fall over itself to accommodate us. Uh, I find that implausible, and I, I'm not sure if technically and uh, juridically um, it would be doable to have the United Kingdom uh, as a, a member of the single market without being part uh, having signed up to all the other things that go with it. I agree with that completely. I think it's it's deeply implausible. Um, I think it's also deeply implausible from a, from a British or, or English point of view, as, as, as the case may be, uh, because it is the ultimate expression of um, taxation without representation. I mean, it, we would be accepting an enormous amount of rules over which we had no control, whatever. Um, it would be a massive humiliation, but also from the point of view of the, of the EU. I mean, they would want um, also freedom of movement and the rest. Um, and these are, are things for which uh, even remain or rejoin inclined opinion in Britain is not really prepared for. Um, until the Labour Party or the Liberal Democrats are prepared to make a full case for rejoining the EU, there is impossible, no possibility, it seems to me, of any real progress on, on, on this. Yes, but we're not going to slip back into the European Union uh, gradually without people noticing, and then they wake up one day and find um, that we've rejoined by stealth. That emphatically isn't going to happen. Not. One final, final question. Uh, will the Conservative Party... Um, which, as you say, ha have now lost one of its um, uh, ideals, that of Singapore upon them, would be able to pursue consistently any other policy. Um, isn't the situation over the next couple of years not many going to be um, damaging and devastating, but it's going to be entirely chaotic? Uh, are the Conservative Party really going to be able to survive for another couple of years uh, without splits and without somehow a general election being provoked? Well, the key to this is, I think, the immigration issue. And of course, one of the problems for uh, Liz Truss in embracing a Singapore on Thames vision is that that implied a very open immigration policy. And as we've seen in the negotiations about the putative trade deal with India, and this is very far from the fortress England view that um, is uh, now the, the remaining available form of Brexit uh, that the Conservative Party can pursue. And so I think that uh, at some stage, immigration is going to come back centre stage as a, a major issue. It may well be the lifeline linked to debates about uh, culture wars and identity and values and things um, that are very much beloved on a particular section of the uh, right of the Conservative Party. I think that a return of this may be seen by uh, many Conservatives as the only strategy for winning the next general election. But of course, this sort of politics against a backdrop of worsening economic circumstances has an enormous potential to become toxic very rapidly. And that is really my principal fear at the moment, is, is a sort of deterioration, a further deterioration in the nature of our political debate into very dangerous waters. Now, whether there are conservative MPs who might have now despaired so completely of the dismantling of any form of Trump, traditional conservatism, that they might be inclined to split from the Conservative Party. Um, I think there's some talk of this, but it's um, a very remote prospect at the moment. It does have one great advantage, though, that such a split would be the one way of guaranteeing that this government ends before its term. But it's the only way. Yeah. Well, um, thank you very much for that, John. Uh, I think that people who were on the Remain side in 2016 did make one error, 
uh, which was to underestimate the moral and political degradation that Brexit would bring into the British political system. Uh, I think it was right about the economics, what the, the Remainers had to say, uh, but I think that not even the most pessimistic of them could have anticipated the way in which Brexit um, has led to chaos, confusion, and, and to, to an undermining um, of our traditional political system and constitutional stability. Uh, those who live longest will know most as ever. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I hope that uh, our viewers have enjoyed the discussion and we'll be looking at other discussions that we have on the Federal Trust website. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, I hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.